basement Yay. of James Street Pub. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, friends, family, and strangers, if you don't know why you're here, just stay. Just stay. You're in for a treat, really. Just a, just a gosh darn treat. Uh, we're a bunch of weirdos, and we say weird and funny things, so we hope that you're our kind of peeps and that you think we're funny. Um, nice. we'll, do some, we'll do some intros. We'll do some, who's this fella? Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm Benoit. I, uh... No, I'm, no, no. No, okay, I'm not related to her in any way, shape, or form. That's correct. Okay, <laughs> next. I'm Boots. I'm Kuto. I am Corey. And I'm Miles. And I'm Edith. Uh, so this, this is a collection of uh, little stories that, that we've put together for your listening pleasure to, to adventurate in your ear, so to speak. Um, we presented some of these at Ottawa Comic Con this year. Some people really liked them. Others were only in the room uh, to take a nap because there was nowhere else to sit down or nap at Comic Con. It was very so awkward for them. Yes. It was awkward for them because they'd, they'd wake up when people applauded and, and they're laugh. like, ah, like all startled and they had no idea what was going on. Yeah. So uh, when you hear something funny, uh, please laugh. Um, <laughs> or like chuckle or. Uh, Gaffaw, titter. I like that word. Any of Chortle. those options Chortle. are Chortle. good. Oh, that's nice. Um, I like that. You can laugh awkwardly. Uh, we also recommend like the belly laugh. That's a good one too, if that's your style. Uh, go for it. Anything else? What? Uh, any? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's get. Let's just dive right in. Yeah. Sure. Should we dive yeah. in? Let's, let's dive Michelle. in. Michelle. Yeah. Good job. Uh. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and now broadcasting to you live from the dungeonous, dark, dank basement of James Street Pub here in Ottawa, Canada, the capital of Canada, we bring to you Adventure in Your Ear, starring the Tasty Tater Nug Players. Brought to you by Adipose Bakeries and Tasty Tater Nugs. Tasty Tater Nugs, now with 2% less carcinogens, you can literally taste the intended flavor. <laughs> hey kids, are you looking for the alternative to healthy eating? Try Adipose Bakery's ta Deep Fried Tasty Tater Nugs. They're one part potato waste byproduct and 10 parts bovine fat renderings mixed together in a giant heated vat to crispy, crunchy, artery hardening goodness. The taste is bio-engineered by scientists to simulate pleasure in your mouth. You won't believe you have taste buds anymore when you've inflicted yourself with Adipose Bakery's Deep Fried Tasty Tater Nugs. Now comes in new wonderful flavors such as B9-22X, Red Dye Number 12, and Potato. Ooh. This has been an iPower Corporation presentation. Warning may cause facial pustule eruptions, trampoline kidneys, and genital clowns. Thank you for joining us for this Adventure in Your Ear presentation. I knew you were the one. I knew you'd be my friend. Together we travel time, stopping Edison. Somehow we'd find the plans between now and then. These are the adventures of Nick and Ben. Why do not I, Thomas Edison, have a theme song? We begin this week's adventure joining Nikola Tesla, inventor extraordinaire, and his trusty time-traveling cohort, the pickled, reanimated corpse of Benjamin Franklin, who must be rebrined daily in a whiskey barrel. But more on that later. Today's episode begins when a Tesla carrier pigeon brings news that nefarious patent thief Thomas Edison is up to his usual tricks in time. <laughs> Franklin, look, one of my trusty Tesla pigeons has brought us news of Thomas Edison's foul deeds. Where do they get their information from, Nicola? Never find out. Why jinx a good thing? 
What does it say? One moment. Yes. Oh, yes. How's your brother? Yes. And your mother, your mom good? Are her egg-laying days over? Really? Pleasantries? With a pigeon? One must. One must. Yes, thank you very much, Cooey. You may uh, take five. Um, so? The message, it says, My God, Edison has been spotted in Boston lurking about the very church where you were pickled only one year before your death. Good gobbledygook. We must stop him before he alters the timeline that created me. Yes, and steals patents. Yes, yes. We all know the evil Thomas Edison is traveling through time to steal as many patents as he can get his claws on to become the richest man alive. You do know that if he gets his hands on Putnam's distilling process, he too might live forever, as long as he is soaked in alcohol. Of course. And I commend you on some excellent exposition. Um, you may. I did. Uh, to the time machine. And forward. To the past. Oh, Tesla, just get in. Nikola Tesla and Benjamin Franklin hop into H.G. Wells' time machine, setting the dial to adventure. Meanwhile, back in 1790, Thomas Edison is hot on the trail of Putnam and the still-living Benjamin Franklin, having pinpointed the approximate location of Franklin's secret distillery to a four-block radius of Boston, Massachusetts. We join him now as he tries to extract information from the tavern goers directly across from the chocolate factory because we like to be geographically and historically accurate. Look it up. Now you know. Hello, barkeep. I am a native of Boston and am looking for a great friend, Benjamin Franklin. I understand he frequents this establishment. We're college buddies from... Harvard. I haven't seen him since Harvard, but I'm hoping to. Uh, perhaps a, a, a business proposition and all that. Business proposition. He does like business. Just so happens he's in business with uh, Mr. Aaron Putnam. Oh, Putnam. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we went to uh, church together, apparently. They usually go to the church next door. They're in there almost every day. Very religious. Aren't they religious there, Mark? Aye, aye, super religious. Always on their knees. I, uh, except when they're running around naked at midnight. Only Benjamin, I, uh, you know, I think. Right, but there's some sort of religious experiment. You know, uh, trying to get uh, closer to God on the rooftops of buildings with all of his clothes off. Aye, aye. aye, aye. Bit of an embarrassment. We like him anyway. Nice guy. Tips well. Made a key glow. Got a thing for kites, he does. Bit weird, don't you think? You uh, don't think the nudity's weird? He's an 85-year-old man. If he wants to prance around in the dark with his jiggly bits wafting in the wind, that's his business. But kites? Yeah, don't tell him to go fly a kite. He will. You won't see him for days. He'll be out there in the fields. Naked with a kite. Making other people's nephews hold it while he's hiding inside. The kite, mind you. My dad, my nephew almost died. Mine did. This is pre key. Took four nephews for him to learn that lesson. Haven't been losing any nephews lately, have you? Mm, not since he's been going to church all the time. I mean, he's there every day. Have you noticed the green smoke coming out of the stack? It's a church, there's no stack. I know, right? People. I uh, thought they was naming the new pope, I did. We don't do that here. What would green smoke mean? Pope Greeny. I think uh, it might be from the undead. Yes, undead. <laughs> think you might be right on that, my friend. <laughs> oi, oi, oi. There's a sign right there that says no maniacal laughing. Yeah, Not since Gussie. No cackling after 8 p.m. You'll get pulmonary thrombosis if you keep doing that. Don't want no one playing the thrombone. Uh, what happened to Gussie? 
good nephew. Weird thing is, we don't even know where the green smoke is coming from. Yeah, it's almost as if there were, like, catacombs underneath. Oh, catacombs, you say? Or, uh, some secret crypt? And if one were to attempt entry into these catacombs, how might one possibly do this? The door? Jeez, uh, why don't you go ask John over there? He's the one who built the damn thing. Yeah, John, you've been awfully quiet. Meh. I ask this because I want to do them <laughs> no harm whatsoever uh, at all. Hey, when you built the secret crypt that nobody's supposed to know about, where did you hide the entrance? Well, you see what I did was, uh, there's a candelabra near the altar. Now, when you pull it, the whole altar moves. Is that what it's called? An altar? Where the priest guy stands? Yeah. Yeah, it's called an altar. That's weird. So you pull the candelabra, the whole altar moves, secret stairs, you go down, bada boom, bada bing. Technically, you could be able to build a secret lab down there, which might produce green smoke, depending on what you're distilling, if you're into that sort of thing. Not saying that's what they do, pure conjecture. Well, thank you, gentlemen and, and ladies. Uh, you've been quite useful. <laughs> no cackling. Apologies. Uh, I think I'll go say hello to my old friend, Benny. Who's he talking about? I think he means Franklin. Oh, nobody calls him Benny. You know, guys, maybe we shouldn't have told him that stuff. I'm sure it's fine. At that moment, Benjamin Franklin and Nikola Tesla are arriving in 1790, just as Edison leaves the tavern. Look! Edison! We must hide before he sees us! But where? Behind this horse? <laughs> Quick, into Captain Jackson's, as of yet completely non-historical chocolate factory. At this point, kind of ordinary. Not even worth mentioning. Run of the mill. But someday, yes, someday! Why are you going on about this? We need to hide. It's really good chocolate, okay? I know the workers. Adipose Bakeries treats them really well. I know the fudge packers. They'll hide us. All right, all right, just get us in. We're in a tight spot. Oh, he's heading for the church. We have to stop him. Where do you think you're going, man? You can't meet yourself again. There's ramifications. Don't you remember what happened last week? Uh, you guys, you are such jerks uh, to each other. Uh, what, what are you saying? I have to go in alone. Unarmed? No, I always carry my trusty Tesla coil. Uh. You mean your electric whip? Listen, when you decide to invent something nifty, you get to name it, okay? Like electricity? You did not invent that. Wait a second. Are you speaking incoherently? Are you sobering up? Oh, oh, oh I, I feel my blood alcohol levels diminishing drastically. Oh, no. What is it? Your fuel levels are getting low. Quickly, man, break out your emergency flask. I already drank all five. Damn it. <laughs> you sit tight and suckle gently on this chocolate liqueur. Oh, I told you we, we should have stopped at the bar across the street. You cannot be entering that establishment. Those people know you. <sighs> what would they possibly have thought of you in your present zombie fight? Uh, they'd probably think I need a drink. And they'd be right. <sighs> Damn it, man. Uh, Why must you be so logical when you're sober? I, I, I thought I was logical when I was drunk. And you would be wrong. Uh, yes, yes, go, go on without me while I refill my vital fluids. Chocolatiers, bring me those chocolate liqueurs. Yeah, the, the many ones are the 40-ounce uh, bottles. That's a very stupid question. Fetch the magnum, boys. Old Benny's on a bender. 
as Benjamin Franklin frankly sucks on chocolate liqueurs to refill his energies and stave off death once again, Nikola Tesla hurries across the street to head off Edison to prevent him from discovering the secret distillery in the catacombs of the historically accurate North Church. Little do they know that Edison is already ahead of them and hiding in the pews. Did he say pubes? No, that's not right. No, it's not. Join us for part two in our next exciting episode of the adventures of Nick and Ben in Bad Investments. These are the adventures of Nick and Ben. Why didn't I invent that? Thank you. <laughs> Once in a zero of Asgard, framed by Loki, banished by Odin, Fakir now roams the human world of Midgard on a series of quests to redeem himself and regain his rightful place amongst the gods of Asgard. Fakir! This week's episode is entitled, That Loki Bastard. We find our hero in what was one, then Norway, and apparently still Norway just shaped a little differently. A little sharper around the edges, perhaps, but not so much that you would not recognize it. Not like you would go up to Norway and say, damn, what happened to your Norway? You used to be so edgy. No, nothing so bold. You throw that kind of barb at uh, Denmark. <laughs> uh, stu stupid, useless git. Uh, nonetheless, our hero, Clay here. Clay here, our hero. Advancing through underbrush and a little bit of overbrush, cutting swaths with his sword, searches for the elusive Seer's Tower. By one Odin's one but slightly cataract eye, I have been traversing these lands in search of the elusive Seer's Tower for what seems like an eternity. It's been about 25 minutes so far. But what doth my eye see hither? Tis a shop of sorts. Beneath a tower of some note, I shall enter and ask the shopkeep for directions. Who enters my seer's tower so boldly? Tis I, Clakeir, fallen seer of Asgard, framed by Loki, banished by Odin. Now, oh, now, Clakeir, no point in doing the narrator's job for him. Skip to page three in your dialogue. There, one second here. Error. It is I, Clay here. Uh, there? <clears throat> Intelligence bar. Before that, you're getting ahead of yourself. That's from episode five. We're not there yet. <clears throat> uh, uh, oh. Who art thou, keeper of this shop? Ah, right there. <clears throat> I am low. I mean, I am the seer. I see all, and I hear all. And I have an excellent deal on lip balm. Ask me a question, and it shall be answered. Just like that? Yes. You just wasted your first and only freebie, bub. The others will cost you. If I ask questions, I must honor you with tribute in exchange. That's a question. Are you serious? There you go again. Oh, just yanking your loincloth, you dwarven imbecile. Seer? Your amusement at my expense reminds me of Loki, that unholy creature who was the cause of my banishment. Ah, yes, Loki. Quite the handsome god, is he not? He is foulness incarnate. Seer, I must return to Asgard and warn Odin of that devil's plot. The same Odin who banished you here in Midgard? Yes, that one. Yes, I'm sure he's waiting to hear from you with bated breath. Besides, I'm sure Loki was just having a bit of sport. He always was the funny one among those Asgardian stuffed shirts, you we know. We do not wear stuffed shirts. 
That flashy showmanship is for the Greeks. We proudly wear fur ponchos. Ah, yes! Would you like to trade yours for a nice mace? Or perhaps this jar of yak's piss? Yeah. You know, yak's piss is really handy in the winter months when the cold nips. Never get caught in the snow without your yak's piss, my grandfather used to say. Really handy in a bind. But it is very rare in these parts. You'll find a single yak. Or it's piss. <laughs> what is this yak you speak of? Something you truly cannot live without. Smell its pungent aroma. <laughs> oh, God, all by head is nose hairs. What am I to do with that? Oh, anoint your nethers. Whatever, get creative. It is yakspis, after all. Rub it on your underarms. The women in these parts go crazy over that sort of thing. Oh, by hairs. See? <coughs> it makes you musky. Oh, I have enough musk for any woman. Yes, I was going to mention that. That's why I suggested the yak's piss. Perhaps we could trade for some of your musk. Musk of an Aesir fetches a high price on the Moors market nowadays. Do you mind if I scrape a bit off you with my dagger? I'd prefer you didn't, but... Ow! Oh! oh, Christ! Oh, there, that'll be fine. Oh. Ooh, I got a couple of hairs. Bonus! I could sell these as Aesir pubes. No one will know the difference. Feel so coarse and bristly. <gasps> I could make brushes. They multiply before your eyes. But this is not why you've come to me. You come for answers. Think upon your question, and I shall more justly set you upon your path. I can't help think about that dear fellow Loki. He's so handsome and funny, even when he's in disguise. What mean you by this? No, oh, nothing, nothing. Don't worry, your shaggy head, ex Aesir. I'm buddy. simply commenting on your situation and how Loki is stunning. Dashing, really. I have always found him to be a foul beast. Oh, snap. Touchy, touchy, biatch. What is this snap? I shall crackle and pop its head. At least I would, if I had not lost my godlike strength. Then that shall be your first quest. Oh. I have been a bit peckish lately, a little starving and thin. You know what brings back strength, don't you? No, I don't. A little meat of the gods? I had heard rumor. Oh, it's no rumor. It's true. It resides on Tears Island. He has cornered the market on meat of the gods. There you go. How do you do that? I don't know. It just happens. Just go visit his little butcher shop. Tears Tenderloins is called. Catchy, is it not? I no. came up. Oh, I like it. I came up with it myself. He opened a nice little brisket shop. Best brisket in Midgard. I go there for brine shavings for my fondues. But I'm speaking over your head. Literally, I'll sit down, little fellow. You really are short. Cute, but very short. What I lack in stature, I make up for with pure will and tenacity. Oh, you can't sell that. So you're going on a quest for the meat of the gods. Those are not fun. You'll probably need a map. Yes, I suppose I will. What are you willing to trade for it? Have I not just given you some of my musk and underarm hair? Then you got some perfectly good yak's piss. What do you expect? It I didn't a... want the yak's piss. No, well, now you have it. It makes a great mayonnaise base. What's a mayonnaise? Oh, you'll find out. Sheesh. Everyone wants something for free. Musk only goes so far. This is a fair trade store. Doesn't seem very fair. It's fair to me. What I would take is a lock of your scrotum. Come again? I mean, <laughs> scrotum hair. I couldn't take the whole thing. What? No, after that you'd be saying, what? Don't worry, nothing so bold. Just a lock of your hair. I have not cut this hair since Asgardian High School. I was in a band 
I played the electric lear. We were called from musk till brawn. Norwegian death metal. We once won in a battle of the bands against the three musketeers. They died of an unfortunate ambrosia overdose while touring in Greece. <sighs> so sad. It was. And I never asked. Moving along. So what do you say, little man? If it helps me in my quest, you may share your required price. Oh, luscious and thick. <gasps> so luxurious. I could stuff a pillow with this. Oh, <gasps> Assyrian hair pillows. Oh, how dashing and comfy. They would really decorate up the place. This place could use a woman's touch. Nya, 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 nya. Here's the map. Get out. But wait. Is it not on an island? How will I go? <gasps> Why, so it is. Trade you something for a boat? Oh, you bastard. Many trades later, our completely shorn and somewhat naked hero ventures out onto the open sea in a raft equipped with his yak's piss and shorn tenacity. Yes, because apparently you cannot sell that. Join us next time for action and adventure on the high seas in our next thrilling episode of Fake Here, Fallen is Here of Asgard as our hero battles a fearsome sea beast in You're Cracking Me Up. Play Kill! Was a wormhole floating round your anus. There was a wormhole, and somehow it sucked me in. Now my beer is getting warm and flat. The computer is my mom. Well, I just smoked my last cigarette, and I still can't find the charm. Oh, space. It's so dark Robots are trying to kill me Oh, space It's so dark Anything Oh, space It's so dark Gotta find my way to 1950 Oh, space It's so dark Space is so dark Earth, the first frontier. No, wait, space. Uh, the uh, other place. This is the story of one man going forth into the unknown to adventure and setting a dangerous precedent. A place fraught with enemies. Pitfalls, big robots, and sexy women with wings. Not that women without wings aren't sexy, but come on. Wings. Not to mention alluring alliteration. Our adventure begins somewhere on the outer rim of Uranus, where a strange phenomenon has materialized, circling Uranus. Yes, we will be making those kinds of jokes. Uranus. In the employ of USA, the United Space Alliance, Buck Schottner, the world's keenest ace pilot, has been shot into space in an experimental craft to investigate this phenomenon, phenomenon and report back to USA. Now in orbit, around the vastness of Uranus, avoiding the gas giant which threatens to <laughs> from below, Schottner comes face to face with what can only be described as a glistening hole, just the side of Uranus. Uso, this is Buck Schottner, the best crack ace pilot the world has to offer. I'm right beside Uranus, staring directly into this giant, glistening, puckered hole. It's a doozy, General. Please advise I am being sucked in. This is General Houston, Tennessee, reporting from Pasadena, Florida. Do you copy? Good job, Shotner. We knew we could count on your ace crack flying. 
Be careful not to get too close. Please penetrate the gaping hole with a probe. A little one, for starters, wouldn't want to cause a tear around your anus. You know what <laughs> trouble I could erupt. Roger, General Pasadena, releasing the probe. In three, two, one, probe away. Wow, it just got aspirated like a vacuum cleaner. Whatever it is, it's hungry. Are you receiving the telemetry? Nope, that's uh, General Tennessee. Uh, I'm in Pasadena, Florida. Yes, it appears to be an interdimensional rift. How our 1950s equipment could possibly tell us this is beyond me, but there you have it. Up until this very moment, it was all speculumtory. And Tony down at the lab just won 10 bucks from the betting pool. Uh, it would appear the hole is reticulating. Copy, General Houston. What does that mean? General Tennessee, you mean. It's getting bigger. Hold on, Houston. Some lights and doohickeys have just turned on in the cabin. Which ones? Doohickey panel A or thingamabob panel B? Uh, thingamajigger panel C. The weird one next to the laboratories. You know, the one shaped like a llama's kidney? Uh, I know the one. Whoa! We could never manage to get that one to work. It appears to glow brighter the closer it gets. I'll just nudge my ship nearer to the opening. Softly, but assertively. Don't want to scare the thing. I don't think it has emotion, Shotner. Not too close, though. You're not protected. Hold on. We're reading a heavy gravitational pull. Interdimensional travel system activated. General, are you getting this? Returning to original coordinates. Oh, never mind. It's taking us back to Earth, I guess. Neato talking computer, though. You swell bunch of guys at USA really know your stuff. This uh, might be the best time to tell you we didn't create this ship. We found it in a German scrapyard after the war. Oh, that Nazi nonsense makes me downright cross. But I gotta say, they make a fine vehicle. No, Shatner. Our initial findings showed us this thing wasn't from Earth. Wherever home is, it ain't here, you hear? Won't be seeing you anytime soon. You mean today? Not ever, I suppose. Oh, snickerdoodle. Activating travel restraints and sedating. Ooh. General, I promise you uh, I'll be coming back. Oh, I, I know you will, son. I know you will. Wait, are you my daddy? <laughs> Figure a speech, boy. Ten to one, he doesn't make it back. For 20 bucks, I'll take those odds. What? You still there? Cut communications. Some time later, our drugged-up hero sleeps through the beeping and booping of bells and whistles on the ship. Lights flash and whirr, making his unconscious state quite tolerable. Before him, an incredible sight is laid out. If only he'd have had the decency of being unconscious for it. Flash of fire in the distance over kilometers, in space, would have told him that he was witnessing a battle, but one carried out in the stillness of the stars. One might say, if one were so bold and unafraid of litigation, a uh, Star War. Until a beam of light hit the bow of his ship, making the computer come alive, realizing danger is very much around it, and it's still knocked out Captain. Quantum jump complete. Stabilizers offline. Scanning area. Reviving pilot. Tapping gently in facial area. No reaction. Tasing gently in sensitive area. Still no reaction. Attempting external stimuli using wheat and hops based liquid. Uh. Oh. Whoa. Where am I? Oh, get me a cold one, will you, Bob? Captain, we've arrived at our intended coordinates. Stabilizers were damaged during the quantum jump, and we are adrift. 
Where are we? Contact Usa. Earth is out of range. Nearest habitable planet is half a day's travel from our current location. You mean Earth? You're not listening. Establishing mental connection with Captain. I, I feel odd, like something is reading my thoughts. I am, and I'm disgusted. <gasps> Mom? That's exactly what my mother would say. I've accessed your memories and found the person you love best. Unfortunately, if I had your voice, it would confuse the audience. So I chose the person who hated you the most. That just makes a whole lot of sense. I'll call you mother from now on. Please don't. So alike. Sigh. I must warn you, we are drifting to within targeting range of the Ein Powers cruise missiles and lasers. We should leave the vicinity. There are cruise missiles and lasers in space? Yes. Space cruise missiles and space lasers. Thank you, Mother. Just don't. I missed you so much. I've seen enough. Let's go back to Earth. It's out of range. The singularity has closed. Oh, so that's what that was. Okay, well, contact USA and let them know. <laughs> They're going to want to be kept in the loop. You're not listening. Earth is gone. We cannot contact it as it is out of range. Well, put it in the logs then. We should probably head back though. It's uh, getting dangerous out here. Are we getting nearer? Just pop open that singularity and we'll just mosey on back. My mission is almost complete. I must get in contact with Commander Kuto. Who might that be? My maker. The maker. You have to call up an engineer? Anyhow, I have to get home. Someone put up some pretty big odds on me. Or against me, depending on your point of view. Captain, I am home. If you want, I can leave you in the middle of the darkest space. Would you like a two or four hour oxygen supply? The resemblance with mother is uncanny. You could have been twins. And no, I don't want to remain here. Take us to your maker if you can. Attempting to initiate energy drive. Uh, Failed. What's the matter? There appears to be a massive energy drain in the aft quarters. That's weird. I'll, I'll go take a look. That, that could be affecting my beer fridge. External device is sucking main power drive dry. Device is... Beer fridge. Attempting to shut down device. No, mother, don't do it! If I do not, we will be captured or destroyed by the Iron Bar Armada. But something terrible will happen if you do disable it. What's that? My beer will get warm! That's just something we'll have to risk if we want to get out of here in one piece. You monster! Device disabled. Engaging energy drive. Not enough power. Engaging backup ethanol drive. We have a spark, Captain. I'm not listening. Sorry. I'm not listening to you, mother. I have to finish 12 cases of beer in the next hour. Never mind. We've been caught in the capture beam of the admirable ship. We're being pulled in. Oh, snickerdoodles. Join us next time for the fascinating and somewhat Freudian episodes of the accidental space adventures of Buck Shotner, Galaxy Galavantir, Explorer of the Unknown, uh, Dimensional Debutante. You get the idea. Anyway... Next episode, guest on the SS Hissy Fit Mega Frown. Ciao. And I think at this point, we're actually going to take a short intermission and uh, we'll be back. Welcome if you got them. Or come back and join us for part two.